like to uh, invite Pastor Wagner to come up and share the word with us. I've got a confession to make. I'm still in Thanksgiving. <laughs> and I came in here and it's just so beautifully decorated, it just calls us to want to worship. I told someone I think I would like to just come in and lower the lights down and just be still and know that he is God in the midst of it all. So today we're going to do, uh, you're going to have to put up with me because we're going to go back to Thanksgiving. And uh, I realized that was Thursday, and uh, as we look down here, we have the Advent candles, and uh, today, it, I believe it is the word of hope that uh, we were to single on. In the church that I come from, we usually do a little service before just reminding us of uh, what all of these candles represent. Uh, but seeing that I'm not prepared to do that, we're going to skip it. So we'll just go to the message. The message is really going to be taken from the book, book of Luke, Luke chapter 22. But before we read that, I need to ask you a question. Probably it's a question you've never been asked before. Did Jesus ever attend a Thanksgiving service? Did he ever go to a Thanksgiving service? Well, later on, we're going to look at Luke 22, and I'm going to read it to you. But you're going to find out that he actually did. In fact, uh, when he goes, we recognize in Luke chapter 22 and verse 15, it says he eagerly looked forward to attending this service. Another translation really just simply says he earnestly, and another translation simply says he fervently. You get the whole idea that he wanted to go to this service. He wanted to be part of a Thanksgiving celebration. And you say, well, Pastor, I didn't see anywhere in Scripture where he attended a Thanksgiving service. Oh, yeah, you did. It wasn't called a Thanksgiving service. It's called Passover. Passover. And when you come to look at the word Passover, that something had to be passed over, you find that the service was a celebration. It was a celebration of joy. It's a celebration of Thanksgiving. It was just a time of reflection. You see, what they were called to do in this service was to look back. In other words, it's called counting your blessings. You had to look back to see how God had really intervened in how he had blessed you. But in this Thanksgiving service or in this Passover, it was not only just looking back, it was looking forward. There was part of that service where they were anticipating Another day of glorious celebration. And so while they were called to, in this service, look back and remember and to relive through the symbolism, they also were called to look forward because there was another time of celebration that was going to be theirs. But let's just talk about Passover. When you find that they came to look back, what were they looking back to? There was a time in Egypt where they were under, well, they were slaves now in Egypt. And God had worked at work in such a way that he had called Moses to tell the people of Israel to sacrifice a lamb. And the lamb had to be an unblemished, perfect lamb. And says, I want you to slay this lamb. And then what I'm telling you to do is over the doorpost, Put the blood. Put the blood over the doorpost. Because there's going to be a death angel that is going to come by. And when that death angel sees the blood on the doorpost, they're going to bypass you. You are not going to be afflicted by death. And so you find, too, that the children of Israel, when they did that, then God provided a way for them to leave Egypt. They got to the Red Sea and find out how are we going to get Two million people across this Red Sea. And God opened up the Red Sea and they walked through, really delivering them from the bondage of slavery in Egypt. Now, when we think of their looking back, and we haven't got to the part of their looking forward, and you recognize they're being delivered, 
you have to see that prophetically, prophetically what is happening here. When we look at the Passover in the past, we see prophetically it is pointing to a day when Jesus would secure our deliverance from the bondage of sin. You had their being delivered from the bondage of slavery. We prophetically look at the Passover, Thanksgiving celebration, with the anticipation of what Jesus Christ is going to do. He is going to deliver us from the bondage of sin. You see, when God had instructed the children of Israel to sacrifice a perfect lamb and to mark the doorpost of their homes with the blood, you find that this was going to deliberately cause them to eventually see the work of Jesus Christ. God had introduced the world to an event that would vividly portray what he was going to ultimately do through his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. So you back up, and we have Passover, looking past, causing us to remember, to think, to relive through all the symbolism. Then you have in the New Testament, we come, and you have different writers, different apostles, look back, and they recall the symbolism in the Passover. You see, centuries later, we read about a man by the name of John the Baptist. And you find that Jesus went out to look at the work of John the Baptist. And when Jesus shows up on the scene, John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He looks at Jesus, and he recognizes his mission is to deal with the sins of of the whole world. You found later that the Apostle Paul is going to write, and you find in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, he identifies Jesus as the Passover lamb. Behold the lamb of God. Paul says, Jesus is our Passover. He is our lamb. But you find that also, Peter, in writing, you find that he connects Passover and the Lamb with Jesus Christ in the same way that John the Baptist did, in the same way the, uh, the Apostle Paul did. And this is what he writes in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. He says, For you know that you are redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from the fathers. But notice this, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like a lamb without defect or blemish. Jesus goes to this Thanksgiving service. You have the apostles look back on that Thanksgiving service, and they connect what happened there with Jesus Christ. In other words, the bottom line is that Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. He is the one who came to bring us back into relationship with God the Father. And when we accept what Jesus Christ has done on the cross of Calvary, shedding his blood, and we ask him to be the forgiver of our sins, you find that the word of God says the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. All. You know, oftentimes we get people simply say, well, I can't come into God's forever family. I'm too big of a sinner. What did I just say? All. all. Whether you consider yourself, no, oh, I'm really not that bad, or whether you consider yourself, <laughs> I'll never make it. What did God says, what Jesus Christ did on the cross for me and for you, it should cleanse us from all sin. No distinction. Once you put the blood on the door, that angel went by. Once you accept what Jesus Christ has done for you, his blood cleanses you from all sin. You're in his forever family. In other words, what he does, he releases us from the bondage of sin. 
the bondage of slavery. And they were literally under Egypt's domination. We were under the domination of our sin nature. And what Jesus Christ did is to release us from it all. We sang that hymn. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. It's the truth. He had an exchange. He took our place so that we wouldn't. So we connect the Thanksgiving service with Passover, and then we find that we are going to look at what Jesus Christ did for us. And again, he is going to do it in such a way that it's going to leave us thinking. In fact, if you have your Bibles with you, you turn with me to Luke chapter 22. I want us to see something as we begin to read from the 14th verse. You see, from my way of thinking, what he says here has impact. In other words, what he is doing in telling us this is a teachable moment. You know, we find as parents, there are teachable moments we have with our children. They don't come as planned. That something happens and they want to know, and you what? Get the privilege of sharing something with them. And you are teaching them what life is all about. This is a teachable moment. And Jesus is asking them to give them ears. Follow along because I have a question to ask you at the end of it. If you are impacted by the same thing I'm impacted by as I read Luke 22, beginning with verse 15, this is what it says. Well, I start with 14. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. They were part of the Passover service. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat again it until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Verse 17, after taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in Remember it to me. In the same way, going back, he gave thanks. And then he told them, in the same way, he gave thanks. And after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. What impacted you? What did you hear him do? What did you hear him say? When I looked at all this, one of the things that impacted me with the fact was Jesus did this with an attitude of thankfulness. He stopped to thank God before doing what he was doing. If you let your eye go back to verse 17, it said, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. And then in verse 19, he says, and he took bread and what did he do? He gave thanks. And he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then you get to verse 20. And it says, in the same way, he gave thanks. And it says, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Yes, he is instituting something. You find that this is the passage, and there are others in Scripture, such as John 13, where Jesus is instituting what we call the Lord's Supper or communion. But they find that not only that, he seems to be breaking tradition. If you know anything about Judaism, there is a lot that they do with what? Tradition. This is tradition. And one of the things in the Passover season, when they celebrate Passover, they have Four cups, four cups, one, two, three, four. And they're there and they are really just dealing with what do these four cups mean? 
There's nothing wrong with tradition. Nothing. What's the problem with tradition? You forget what the tradition means. You forget it. You have the Advent wreath down here. Each one of those candles represents something. And yet we come every year, and what do we do? Have to be what? Reminded what those candles mean. And it's not only what those candles mean, but what context does it have in the word of God for us? They had four distinct cups. And these cups were really just there to really just tell us something. And you find that these four cups that they drank every year, it was an annual event. God had instituted and said, this is what I want you to do. He even prescribed when it takes place. And you find that it's good for them to remember, to recall, to revisit the symbolism of Passover. So what are those four cups? What do they tell us? Well, they tell us the story of redemption. They tell us that, number one, the first cup is going to be, I will bring him out. I will bring them out. The second one is, I will deliver. The third one is, I will redeem. The fourth cup is, I will praise. I will bring them out. What does that deal with? You just go back to your history, and you find that in the providence of God, God set a man down in Egypt. His name was Joseph. He was sold into slavery. It just seemed to be very upsetting, but God had his plans. Because God used Joseph and his administrative ability and his ability to really work with uh, what he had, knowing that there were going to come seven years of famine. And so God provided with his wisdom to provide for those years of famine. So his family over here in Canaan, when they didn't have food, where did they go? To Egypt. And the whole process, they eventually left the area of Canaan and went down to where? Egypt. That was all part of God's doing. I will bring them out. But then we find out while they're down in Egypt, what happens? They're down there for 400 years. And in that whole process of 400 years, they are made slaves in Egypt. It's a gradual process, but they soon find that there is a pharaoh who knew not know, who did not know what? Joseph. So they were put into slavery. So the one who brought them down is now going to deliver them out. And then it says, I will redeem. Remember, the redemption is going to come through. How are they going to redeem them? The blood placed over the doorpost. The means by which the perfect lamb of God can take that blood, put it on the doorpost, so that when the death angel came, it passed you by. You were redeemed. Your oldest did not suffer death. But then the fourth cup says, I will praise. I will praise. Stop with me for a moment. There were four cups. If you look at Luke chapter 22, something happens. Jesus does not drink the fourth cup. The fourth cup is left full. He goes through three of them. Why? He tells them at least twice, I will no longer eat again until it finds its fulfillment where? in the kingdom of God. And then he says, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until what? The kingdom of God. He is postponing something. So he says, I want you to stop and remember. I want you to remember your history. I want you to remember how God has been in control of all of the circumstances. What he is really saying is, I've reserved a time known as the kingdom of God. 
when will we experience the kingdom of God? When we're all home. My friend, we're only passing through. We're passing through. There's a point at which you and I will leave here and be there with him. But until he has his whole family, all those who come by faith and say, yes, I need you. I need your blood to cleanse me from all my sin. He says, until that time, I am not going to drink this cup. Because you see, this is the cup of celebration. This is the cup of praise. This is the cup of, you want to go to a huge, and I mean huge, praise time. It's waiting for you in heaven. That's where it is all going to be. That's where we will together celebrate, we'll praise. And he says, I'm not going to partake of this until you're all home. You know, and I stopped to think about it. And that uh, he once again takes and offers us the bread, offers up the cup of wine. And then he takes the fourth cup. And he leads us into what we're praising for. Have you ever thought what we're going to praise him for? Well, it's up here. The nail prints in his hands. And we will see it. And we will be filled with awe. Why? He did it for whom? For me? For you? I'm not sure if any of us are going to be standing at that point. I think we'll all fall down and worship. Let me interject here. Do you recognize that worship takes work? Did you prepare before you came to worship? You have to think about worship. You say, well, I just came in, I just think. But did you worship? Who were you singing to? When you prayed, who was listening? You know, we have to take and work at preparing ourselves for worship. In a sense, God is preparing us for that what? Time of worship, that time of praise. And he's doing it in a number of ways. So when I think of Luke chapter 22, and I read it, what impacts me, what really just... Um, just says, wow, think about this, Bob. Jesus is giving thanks. Now, remember the scene. It's in the upper room. This is going to be less than 24 hours. What is Jesus going to be experiencing? He is going to be experiencing hurt, abuse, suffering, humiliation, He's here in the upper room doing the Passover service with them, thanking God. His whole demeanor is one of thanksgiving. So I asked myself, did he not know what was coming ahead? Did he not know in less than 24 hours what would be happening to him? And the word of God plainly tells us that he does know. But he made a choice. Do you realize Thanksgiving is a choice? It's a choice I make. I either choose to be thankful or I choose to be what? Down. Grumpy. Depressed. I choose. When I get up in the morning, I make a choice. How am I going to face life? Do I want to face it? In a positive way with thanksgiving? Or do we want to see everything in a negative? I choose. Jesus chose to be thankful. Thankful. But when we think in terms of being thankful, what does our mind go to? Oh, we start doing this. I'm thankful for friends. I'm thankful for family. I'm thankful for... And it all deals with what? Circumstances. 
we are thankful for the conditions that I find myself in. Do you realize that circumstances are going to do what? Change. What happens to our thankfulness when our circumstances are not to our liking? In other words, the circumstances change. You get a telephone call. You just get word. And things take on a different meaning. There are certain clouds there. You see, Jesus knew what was coming ahead. There was going to be hurt, abuse, suffering, humiliation. You know what God has done for us? He's kept us from knowing what was coming ahead. You didn't count that as one of your Thanksgiving blessings, but that's one of your blessings, that you don't know what tomorrow is going to hold. You don't know what the hurts are. You don't know what the abuse. You don't know what the suffering. You don't know what the humiliation is. Jesus knew. And what did he do? He chose to be thankful. Why? He focused on the condition of his heart. You know, the word of God says, love the Lord your God with what? With your heart? With your soul? With your mind? What's your total being? So when we start talking about our minds, we're talking about circumstances. So when we talk about our heart, who are we? Who are we? And what you have is the heart is going to reveal the condition. What's going on on the inside? You see in John 13, again, talking about this upper room, in John 13, 1, it says, Jesus knew that he had come from the Father, he was going back to the Father, and he chose to extend to them, his disciples, show them the extent of his love. He had purpose for that meeting. He wanted to love on them. But now an interesting verse you find in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8. And this one always blows me away every time I read it. It says, Jesus learned obedience through suffering, through suffering. That's a strange verse. You mean that God is teaching us through the good as well as the negative? Yes, he is. We want the good rather than the negative. But when I am experiencing the negatives, I'm experiencing the hurt, I'm experiencing the abuse, I am experience suffering. I am experiencing humiliation. God is trying to teach us something. And sometimes it's not so much that we need to be taught, but others who see us handling what we're going through are what? Being taught. God has purpose for what he is doing in our lives. And so what you've got is that Jesus knew if you look at Luke 22 and verse 42, the scene is a little different. The scene is the Garden of Gethsemane. And you find that Jesus is talking to God. We call it praying. And he just bows his head and prays and he says, Father, if there's any way, any means, other than my going to Calvary, Father, so be it. You find, he finally warms up and says, Father, I want your will, not mine. I really want you to take this cup of suffering away from me. I want you to take this abuse that I'm going to get. I want you to take, you know, this humiliation. I want you to take it all away so I don't have to do that. But you see, Jesus knew that without the shedding of blood, there was no what? Remission of sins. If Jesus was released from all of that, what would happen to us? We'd all be in hell. We'd all be, there was no escape, none. Do you realize there's another verse of scripture that says, for the joy that was set before him, 
he endured it. What does that mean? All those who come to him by faith are his sons, his daughters, his children. And he is looking forward to that fourth cup. He's looking forward to that big praise service. But that big praise service is not going to happen until when? We're all home. Every one of us are at home with him. We are his joy. Do you know that you bring joy to God? When we are living in obedience to his word, that brings joy to him. When we're not, he's not happy. But to find that for the joy that was set before him. You see, Jesus is not, um, well, he knew hurt is hurt. You know, you get hurt and you know you're hurt. Jesus is not a masochist who is just saying, sure, I can handle, put those nails in. He's not a masochist. See, for the joy that was set before him, we were on his mind. We were in his heart. And what did he do? He sacrifices himself for us. An amazing thought. An amazing thought. So what you have is, Jesus has the big picture. He's the big picture. I'm here by the will of the Father. I am going to experience what is ahead, because that's his plan. But I'm also choosing, while I know that his plan, I am choosing to do it with what? Thankfulness. One of the things that he does not do when he goes through this whole day that's going to be ahead of him, he doesn't complain. He speaks not. He just allows what was going to happen to happen. But you see, it's for the joy. It's for us. He sees eternity. The big picture. He sees eternity. He sees all those who are going to be there because of what he is going to do for them. Yes, he recognizes the hurt. Yes, he recognizes all of the pain and the abuse, suffering, the humiliation. He understands it. But he does it. And he does it because he chose to be thankful for what would happen, not what was happening. We look at the circumstances and we are grateful for what Jesus Christ did. And for all of that, and we give praise. But we have to look at why he chose to do it. Because he chose to be thankful. How do you focus on choosing to be thankful? And it is that you begin to put God's word into your hearts. What did Jesus say? No. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Where is God where it hurts? Right there. He's right there with you. That's an amazing thought. He's right here. When you discover in his word that he is saying that there are other things we need to be thankful for. Not only besides I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. But he says this one from the book of Romans. There is nothing, there is nothing that can separate you from my love. Can I give that to you again? Nothing. No thing. There is no hurt. There is no abuse. There is no suffering. There is no humiliation. I don't care the abuse of how many times you're rebuked or how many times you're put down because you're a Christ follower. I don't care if tomorrow means that there's going to be certain sufferings that you weren't planning on. There's certain illnesses, certain things that come your way. The humiliation that family or friends just bring upon you. One of the truths is nothing, no one 
can separate you from the love that is in Christ Jesus. He also says, this is the promise, I will take you by my powerful right hand and walk with you. You're not going into that surgery alone. You're not going into that funeral home alone. You're not going into that atmosphere which is caustic, alone. I walk with you. I will take you by my powerful right hand. You see, these are the things that are dealing with what? Your heart. The circumstances are your mind. But where is your heart? He says, I will be your defender. It's like, I'm going to take you into the courtroom. I'm going to be your defender. I'm going to be your refuge, your shelter. You're going to find that this is the place you're going to feel secure. This is the place that is going to keep you. I'm your protector. I'm your shepherd. I'm your shepherd. Follow me. Follow me. You see, Jesus chose thankfulness because he knew the condition of his heart. He knew God was with him. Oh, it is true that on the cross of Calvary, God forsook him. But that was a reason, too, because God cannot look on sin. And what was Jesus doing? He was atoning for my sin, for your sin. All of our sins were placed upon him. And God had to what? Turn away from it. And my way of thinking, Jesus had always walked in the relationship of having his father with him. But the pain of, sub, of separation, of knowing that the father, he had to do it alone, alone. God forsook him. Why? He was doing it for whom? For us. I don't care how many sins we've done, they're all where? All on the cross. When he says that he is going to remove them as far as the east is from the west, that's what he has done. The enemy of our soul wants to bring us back to concentrate on their, they're gone. That's all been settled. And you see, Jesus looked to his heart. He looked to the promises of God. He looked to the future. He was anticipating what? The fourth cup. Who are they anticipating it with? With me. With you. There's a huge, huge celebration that's coming ahead. So my dear friends, what do I want you to do today? I want you to choose thankfulness. You're coming up. And if anything can be said about year 2020, it's been different. It is really different. How we did Thanksgiving was what? Different. Not a whole bunch of people around. You know, isolation, wearing masks. I mean, come on, 2020. Who would have thought? But regardless of what 2021 holds, you can enter into that year. You can enter into the Christmas season with thankfulness. Thankfulness. Why? It's a daily choice. And I say daily. You may have already done that. But every day I choose what? I choose. How am I going to face this day? Am I facing it negatively or am I facing it positively? I choose. I encourage you, my friend on a daily basis, to choose. Focus on Christ. Focus on God's word. Focus on his promises. Because God and his word, notice this, are the same today as they were yesterday and what they will be tomorrow. Because he changed not. We change. He doesn't change. His word doesn't change. There's the bedrock. There's the stability. And so, my friend, be thankful. Join me in prayer. Father, as we come, we confess the fact that 
We think of ourselves as being a thankful people. And yet we know our God that uh, in many ways we are thankful. But your word calls us to be thankful from the heart, to remind ourselves of whose child we are, to remind us of the fact that your love is the stability rock, that your care is constant. Father, that you don't change because we change. Whether we choose not to follow you, your love is still there. I pray, our Father, that you might continue to teach us these things in the inward depths of our hearts so that we are really seeking to live in such a way that your name is honored, it is glorified. So we come, our God, just asking that you might finish these thoughts these words in each of our hearts and our lives, and in the whole process, we grow and we just naturally reflect you. We pray this in your loving name. Amen.